Good evening, one and all present here. I am Mona Lisa from Clarnet, the designated session assistant for the Seamless Experience. Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used digitech platform, offering multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be a part of the digital partner for this event organized by Society of Onco Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. Then today's session is all about anesthetic concerns in thyroid and parathyroid malignancies. So thank you for your patient listening, everyone. Let us get started to, with today's session, to which I would like to invite Dr. Anjali Ma'am to take the session forward. Over to you, Ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, could we have the slide uh, first introductory slide, please? So while we are displaying that slide. Thank you all for logging in. I know it's a very exciting day. Uh, India is playing Sri Lanka. So I'm glad that all of you have joined us over here. And uh, this is the 33rd uh, iteration of uh, our lecture series. Today, we are going to discuss thyroid and parathyroid malignancy. To chair the session, we have Dr. Namrata Ranganath, who actually needs no introduction. All of us know her so well from so many conferences. But uh, she is the professor and former head of the Institute of uh, Kidwai Memorial Institute of Oncology. She's been practicing anesthesia for nearly three decades now, onco-anesthesia, and has a special interest in head and neck surgeries, rehabilitation, and palliative medicine. And beyond that, she's a very bubbly person and a very helpful person. So, uh, Dr. Namrata, I invite you to introduce our speaker and to check the session. Could you put this slide, please? It's such a privilege to introduce Dr. Kavita Lakshman, our associate professor, who's been with us from last 10 years. She did her MD from Delhi, you know, uh, UCMS, and she received a COPS award in pain in 2011. She's won the best research paper award in Tianja. He, she received a young anesthesiologist award in Isakon 2019, and she has three chapters written and has interest in avian head and neck cancers and VATS. And uh, I would say that she has a keen interest to learn new things and to apply for patient care. Over to you, Kavita. Um, good evening. I'm Dr. Kavita Lakshman. A uh, topic given to me is uh, anesthetic considerations in thyroid and parathyroid malignancies. Uh, we start off with uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative concerns in thyroid malignancies, followed by specific consideration in retrosernal extension, tracheal resection, and endoscopic thyroidectomies, followed by robotic thyroid surgeries. Thyroid surgeries, uh, thyroid cancers constitute 1 to 4% of all malignancies with a female preponderance of 3 to 1. There is a rise in, in the incidence of thyroid cancer globally, mostly because there is an increase in rate of diagnostic imaging being done. Papillary and follicular thyroid cancer constitute 90 to 95% of all thyroid cancers, followed by medullary thyroid cancer, which constitutes 1 to 2%, followed lastly by anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, which constitutes less than 1% of, of all of thyroid malignancies. Surgical resection forms the mainstay of treatment in thyroid malignancies, followed by radioactive iodine ablation with thyroid hormone suppression. High-grade malignancies, which are not uh, receptive to the following treatments, will receive systemic chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Moving on to preoperative assessment, we need to assess and find, uh, elicit symptoms for uh, hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism in these patients. We, these patients may have compressive symptoms involving the trachea, the esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve, superior vena cava. They may have symptoms of distant metastasis involving the brain, the liver, bones, and the lungs. We may have to elicit history of any past history of radiation involving any part of the body or head and neck region to be specific. This lady came into our uh, uh, PAC clinic, posted for thyroidectomy for, uh, for her medullary CA thyroid. We incidentally noticed that her uh, her uh, blood pressures were well over 200 by one, 120. Her thyroid function tests were well within normal range. 
and so we worked up for pheochromocytoma and the lab reports came up came back that the vmas and the metanephrines were very high and she fit into the criteria of men 2a since they run in families we got her sibling evaluated for the same and it turned out that she too had medullary ca thyroid so this is the importance of identifying associated neuroendocrine tumors and to identify certain siblings which may have the same symptoms. Moving on to physical examination, they help in identifying signs of hyperthyroidism, signs of hypothyroidism, and also I help in identify associated neuroendocrine disorders. Like this gentleman, 21 year old gentleman who came in for thyroid surgery again with the medullary CA thyroid. He, were, he was having morphinoid features. He had a medullary CA thyroid. And then if you notice, you can see numerous submucosal neuromas fitting into the criteria of men to be. This is followed by the examination of the thyroid swelling and our routine airway examination. Apart from the routine investigations of complete bed count, LFT, RFT, serum electrolytes, RBS, chest x-ray, and ECG. These patients are subjected to specific investigations like IDL, soft tissue neck x-ray, AP and lateral view, thyroid function test, and in certain scenarios, CT scan, bronchoscopy, and virtual endoscopy. Well, if you see the chest, uh, chest x-ray, you will be able to appreciate the tracheal deviation over here in the first x-ray and in the second. Lateral uh, neck x-ray shows the tracheal compression by the thyroid swelling in the first one. And you can see the deviation of the trachea in the uh, AP uh, view of the neck x-ray. CT scan helps us in delineating whether there is tracheal compression by the thyroid swelling, the extent of tracheal compression, the intraluminal, the narrowest luminal dimension of the trachea, and if at all there is any tracheal erosion, like how you can see in the CT scan, you can see there is a breach in the tracheal wall and there is a growth in the posterior aspect of this trachea. Moving on to intraoperative concerns. Patients who are having severe hypothyroidism usually will be deferred from surgery because there is high perioperative morbidity associated with them. Moderate, mild to moderate hypothyroidism does not increase perioperative uh, morbidity, but they come in with the added challenge of a difficult airway owing to airway edema, large tongue with a large thyroid. They tend to have a bit of gastric, delayed gastric emptying, so we'll have to take care of uh, aspiration for plexus. And they tend to have increased sensitivity to inhaled anesthetic sedatives and narcotics. And then that explains why there is delayed uh, extubation in these patients. Moving on to anesthetic concern in hyperthyroid patients, they come with a, uh, they usually are put in a whole uh, host, uh, whole host of uh, uh, drugs to control their uh, hyperthyroid features. Incomplete control of them will result in either intraoperative or uh, postoperative thyroid storm, which we do not want to encounter. And as you, as you can see that the, the major brunt of hyperthyroidism is on the CVS. So that takes a major brunt of the disease and it, it manifests in various things like be it hypertension, ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure, or a whole list of arrhythmias which can occur in the perioperative period. So this slide shows an average patient who presents to our clinic with a thyroid malignancy. It would make even the most seasoned anesthesiologist take a step back, take a deep breath, and plan the anesthesia for such patients. Invariably, a large thyroid presents as a difficult airway owing to the anterior posterior compression of the large thyroid gland onto the trachea. There is difficulty in extension. Because of this, the airway accesses don't fall into line during intubation. Because of the large th uh, thyroid, again, there is lateral deviation of the uh, trachea. And this also makes surgical access all nearly impossible. If there is tracheal infiltration, that reduces the um, uh, mobility of the laryngeal structures. A usual plan of action in, a, in the management of an anterior, uh, anticipated difficult airway is we always keep our uh, difficult airway cart ready in which uh, there is a rigid bronchoscope mandatorily. 
In case of a compromised airway, an inhalation induction with sevoflurane and oxygen is preferred technique as it prefers, uh, it preserves spontaneous ventilation. But again, uh, this is a, a, a topic of uh, controversy. There, there are school of thought which is for it. There is a school of thought against it. Then uh, in case uh, uh, after that, this is followed by mask ventilation and a, a, a check scopy. Flexometallic tube is usually preferred to, pre to maintain uh, patency and to prevent collapse. And uh, we have to ensure that the tube is fixed beyond the, uh, the narrowing. And in all cases, an extubation plan has to be kept in place. Um, this is one of the cases which came, uh, which was uh, 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 operated in our institute. She is a 48 year old lady. She presented with eight year history of a large thyroid swelling. She was posted for a thyroidectomy. Uh, she had no symptoms of uh, tracheal compression or uh, nerve compression, but she was comfortable resting in the uh, in the right lateral position. Her uh, lab reports uh, were unremarkable. Soft tissue neck x-ray showed tracheal compression and deviation of the trachea. Ideal showed normal vocal cords. CT scan showed that she had a 12 into 24 centimeter thyroid mass with tracheal compression, narrowest dimension being 0.9 mm. So as always, we start off with a uh, difficult airway card with rigid bronchoscope. We induced her with IV uh, propofol. Uh, then we noticed that we were not able to mask ventilate. Uh, immediately, an assistant stepped in and lifted the thyroid mask, which is probably because it fell after the patient uh, lost consciousness. So as soon as the thyroid mask was lifted, we were comfortably able to mask ventilate. We went ahead and paralyzed the patient, and we were successful in intubating with a size 7 mm ET tube. Surgery was uneventful. The surgeon, however, had a, suspect, uh, a suspicion of probability of trachomalacia owing to the large thyroid and the long duration of uh, the thyroid swelling. So uh, we went in and we kept the patient deep. We reversed her. We inserted a fiber optic bronchoscope through the endotracheal tube. We used a CMAC video laryngoscope to examine the vocal cords. And we slowly withdrew the endotracheal tube over the uh, fiber optic bronchoscope and examined, for, examined the trachea for, and noticed if there was any end expiratory uh, collapse of the uh, tracheal wall, which is usually seen in, uh, in uh, tracheal Malaysia. Had it been positive and if there was a collapse, we would have either chosen to go ahead with reintubation or go in for an upfront tracheostomy. Uh, since she did not have any features of uh, tracheomalacia, which was confirmed on uh, fiber optic uh, bronchoscopic examination, uh, patient was comfortably uh, extubated in some time. Moving on to case number two, this gentleman was a 26-year-old with a, a three-month history of a small thyroid swelling, but he did present with strider and he was only comfortable in sitting up position. Lab values again were unremarkable. FNAC showed again the culprit was papillary CA thyroid, which is which looks very innocently small, but uh, it's pretty malicious. Ideal showed bilateral vocal cord, which were mobile. Then moving on to the soft tissue uh, neck x ray, the AP view shows this classic. R glass pattern, and you can see there is absolutely no lumen left, just completely occluded over here. Moving on to the um, uh, virtual endoscope, you can see that as you go down, you will be able to see complete occlusion. That's complete occlusion over there. So, virtual endoscopy helps in a uh, non uh, uh, a non-invasive way of analyzing the uh, intraluminal component of the tracheal, uh, tracheobronchial tree, so which is of uh, great assistance to us. And then at the side, we have our uh, uh, CT scan of this patient. If you see over here, you can see it just collapses. So, and this is just a snapshot of the uh, of the uh, cross section area, which is of uh, which is the area of interest to us. 
So that is the narrowest portion of the trachea, which is totally engulfed by this thyroid swelling. So when we read the report of the CT scan, it said that uh, the minimal, uh, minimum tracheal lumen dimension was 1.2 mm. 1.2 mm is quite a small uh, uh, dimension. So this, these were the few points which we followed in our institute while managing this case. So we had a very clear communication between the anesthesia and the surgical team. We had planned our plan A, plan B of airway axis, and we rehearsed the plan. Each one involved in the plan was given a designated role and they would stick to the role. You would always keep a senior anesthesiologist informed that this case is going to be taking place in this OT and they're always on standby. And we always have a backup plan, what to do when everything fails. So, we again start off with a uh, difficult airway car. We had pre oxygenated the patient. We uh, chose to uh, give IV induction with proper fall. We were comfortably able to mask ventilate the patient. Simultaneously, high frequency nasal oxygen uh, was in, in, in play. That was around uh, 30, uh, 30 liters per minute. We did check scopy with CMAC uh, video laryngoscope. We did uh, a 10% spray of uh, lignocaine onto the vocal cords and try passing a bougie. But uh, as soon as we tried passing it, he started to cough violently. So we, we deepened the plane and then we continued to mask ventilate. Then a decision was taken to paralyze the patient. We failed to pass the bougie the first attempt, but the second was successful. We were able to railroad a 6.5 mm internal diameter endotracheal tube onto the bougie, and it went with a bit of a bitty feel, which means it was a pretty snug fit. So a tube uh, was uh, a tube pl uh, placement was confirmed. Surgery went uneventfully. So when you see this. Uh, this was a rigid bronchoscope, which was ready uh, by our surgeon. And I guess the only person who was more stressed out than the anesthetist was the, our uh, head and neck oncosurgeon, who was watching every step of the way like a hawk waiting to see when help is needed and he has to intervene. So this is an intraoperative picture of uh, uh, the trachea. This is a typical scabbard trachea where you can see it is totally compressed laterally. So uh, intraoperatively, we got to know by the surgeon that uh, uh, both the recurrent laryngeal nerves were involved and could not be preserved. And considering this much amount of tracheomalacia, we chose to do an elective tracheostomy on table, which went uneventfully. When you look at uh, literature, there's uh, quite a bit of interesting literature coming in way in the form of case reports. So there's this uh, interesting case report coming in in the year uh, 2023 from the US, which says that similar similar uh, similar thyroid uh, malignancy, a large thyroid with tracheal compression was handled. So they have shown they have said that uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy is the uh, standard gold standard in management of such large thyroids with uh, tracheal compression. And they successfully were able to intubate uh, this uh, uh, this case where uh, there was quite a bit of narrowing, around 6 mm narrowing. They used a uh, uh, MLS tube. They used a pediatric uh, fiber optic uh, uh, fiber uh, fiber optic scope to introduce this MLT. They failed the first time, but they were successful the second time. And uh, surgery went uneventfully. Then there's this uh, interesting case uh, again uh, um, in the year 2020 from Iran, uh, which again dealt with a similar case and they were successfully able to intubate using a video laryngoscope. And then uh, there's this, this interesting study uh, in the year 2019, where uh, people did try to use uh, fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy, but uh, um, they they were not successful, so they had to go in for uh, video laryngoscope uh, assisted intubation, and they were successful at it. So we have seen fiber optic being used successfully. They have used they have seen video uh, uh, um, um, video laryngoscopy being used. Then you have seen okay. Then here is another interesting case report where uh, they, they used fiber optic, they failed a couple of times, and then 
what did they do? They restored to conventional laryngoscopy and they intubated it. So there becomes a hybrid technique. So they did conventional laryngoscopy. They used a glide scope like a, light, like, like a stillet and intubated it. So there were two techniques which were employed to secure the airway in this case report. Another uh, interesting case, uh, uh, case report from Korean Journal of Anesthesia, where again here, firstly, fiber optic was used, awake fiber optic failed. Then they used video laryngoscopy, failed. Then they used direct laryngoscopy, failed. So they put a plan in place where they used McGraw video laryngoscope and they used a fiber optic bronchoscope like a stillet and used it for tracheal intubation and they were successful. This one shows a case report of how they used, uh, how they intubated, how they did awake uh, intubation in a patient of, of large thyroid swelling with retrosternal uh, extension. And this uh, another interesting case report from uh, from uh, from Ghana, where uh, such a patient was not uh, subjected to either fiber optic nor was she uh, subjected to video video laryngoscopic uh, assisted intubation. She she went in for a upfront tracheostomy. This could probably be because they did not have enough infrastructure. That could probably be the reason. So after review of literature, so we get to know that these are the options which are available for uh, intubating such cases. So we have uh, awake fiber optic bronchoscopy, awake video laryngoscopy, tracheostomy, video laryngoscopy under anesthesia after inducing the patient, and hybrid technique, which employs two techniques together to uh, reap the benefits of both. Another interesting uh, uh, expert uh, opinion, uh, which was published uh, in the year 2020, uh, 2011 in Anesthesia. This was a, uh, a compendium which was published regarding the opinion of eight experts who were presented with a similar case scenario where they'll have to intubate a, a, large, a large thyroid swelling with uh, considerable tracheal uh, uh, narrowing. You can see that each one chose a different plan A. Some chose intravenous induction, some chose uh, inhalation induction, some chose video laryngoscopy, some chose uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy. If you see, even their plan B is varying considerably. Some went with rigid bronchoscopy, some went for cardiopulmonary bypass and so on and so forth. And their extubation strategy also differed quite a bit. So what we can, uh, what we can gather from this is the airway, um, the anesthesiologist should employ the technique which they're most skilled at, number one. There is not one plan which fits all the patients. So you have to individualize your airway management strategy according to your case, and you have to customize it to the needs of the patient and as per your institution protocol as well. So moving on to a case, interesting case uh, number three, which was done in our institute. Uh, this is an eight-year-old child who came in with a small swelling, which was uh, the history of around one year. And uh, he came in with strider. So, and uh, vocal, uh, uh, I, ideal show that he had uh, right-sided uh, vocal cord palsy. Uh, the, the sad part of this is uh, the style was uh, rejected from quite a few institutes. And he did quite a bit of uh, running around before he came to our institute. So this is how we went ahead with this. If you see the CT scan, you can see this horseshoe, all horseshoe shaped uh, uh, thyroid swelling almost encircling it 360 degrees. And if you see, it was uh, the narrowest uh, uh, intratracheal uh, uh, dimension was around 2.8 mm in a child, eight year old child. So uh, then we, when we look at the, the sagittal films, you can see not only is it causing narrowing, it is quite, it, it's considerably uh, uh, long enough or long enough to cause quite a bit of intraluminal narrowing. This quite a bit of narrowing is noticed over here. This may be the reason why most of the institutes rejected uh, him and uh, deferred surgery. So uh, he came to us. So uh, we did not have uh, fibro, uh, fi uh, pediatric fiber optic bronchoscope. We did not have a pediatric rigid bronchoscope. Even if we had uh, a pediatric uh, a fiber optic bronchoscope, yeah. to use fiber optic bronchoscope as a first line of management in airway in a child, 
which is in strider would not be advised as it, it, he, it the child would have been pretty combative so we went in with something called as laryngotracheal fissure by our uh, head and neck onco surgeon where he just identifies the thyroid cartilage or whichever part of the uh, cartilage which is easily identifiable and he just places a vertical incision over it so this is a, 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 tra a, a laryngotracheal fissure and we were able to place a, a ET number six and uh, we were able to proceed with the surgery and uh, the child uh, uh, ended up having a permanent tracheostomy because he already he presented with the right vocal cord palsy and the left one was involved uh, in the, the disease so that could not be preserved. So this is a intraoperative image of uh, 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 larynx fissure to better appreciate how uh, the larynx has just been incised just like that and the, the, the tube was placed over here, it was just taken out. Uh, this is the intraoperative uh, picture to better understand what was done. So the child is comfortable and very much alive today because of uh, uh, this feat by our uh, head and neck surgeon. Moving on to the extubation. Uh, a society of uh, head and neck anesthesia has come up with its own uh, guideline and protocol for management of extubation in uh, um, thyroidectomies. This is quite a busy slide. So let's break it down. So in case, uh, first we see if there is any swelling, airway swelling. So if it is there, we either choose to reevaluate the, uh, the, the situation in 24 hours or we choose to reintubate. In case we're anticipating vocal cord palsy and it is an easy intubation, we either choose to do extubation or it, in case the uh, patient was intubated with the endotracheal tube, if uh, uh, LMA was in place for surgery, we can use a fiber optic bronchoscope through the LMA to identify if there's any vocal cord palsy. If it was a, uh, if you're anticipating vocal cord palsy in a case which was difficult to intubate, we uh, either, uh, and the patient is spontaneously breathing, we either choose to either go in for a reintubation or go in for an upfront tracheostomy, or we can leave an airway exchange catheter in place. And the further management would depend based on the presence of either unilateral or bilateral vocal cord, uh, vocal cord palsy. So in case there is any airway swelling, and uh, there, uh, in case there is no airway swelling and it was an easy extubation, easy intubation, we proceed with the uh, extubation. Then we have to weigh the benefits of uh, deep versus awake uh, uh, extubation in this case. And if it was a difficult intubation, we uh, we tend to leave an airway catheter, uh, airway exchange catheter in place and we extubate over it and then uh, we wash the patient. In case there was a high risk of uh, having airway uh, edema, we can uh, do a, a intraoperative uh, cuff leak test, or we can do an ultrasound assessment of uh, uh, the the trachea and the cords, or we could just plain go in for a, a direct uh, direct uh, laryngoscopic view or a fiber optic guided uh, view to identify any uh, um, uh, uh, laryngeal edema or a vocal cord uh, uh, edema. So moving on to uh, post operative concerns. Uh, post-operative, uh, post-exhibition strider is uh, quite a worrisome thing that we need to handle. Uh, so that, that could be because of uh, laryngeal edema, recurrent laryngeal palsy, hematoma, tracheomalacia, hypocalcemia, followed by uh, uh, post-operative nausea, vomiting, pain, and uh, pneumothorax is mostly in retrosernal uh, 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 thyroid swellings that we come across pneumothorax. So we'll take it one at a time. So in case uh, the patient has laryngeal edema and then we can defer uh, intubation, reintubation for some amount of time, uh, we can give 100% oxygen by face mask, prop the patient up, give him neb uh, uh, nebulized racemic uh, epinephrine, give him a steroid a shot of dexamethasone. Uh, 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 Heliox can be uh, tried and and very importantly, we need to assess why the patient is tried or we might be missing something else. So that needs a fiber optic evaluation as soon as we can evaluate the patient. 
moving on to uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve in, uh, injury. So unilateral is not a threat to the airway at all. We just have a hoarseness and a bit of voice impairment. If it's bilateral partial <clears throat> injury, this is life-threatening because the vocal cords tend to be abducted. So this requires uh, reintubation or tracheostomy or or sometimes at times it gets uh, uh, relieved for some time uh, with positive pressure or uh, ventilation, but then we, we uh, definitely have to either go in for a reintubation or a tracheostomy. Um, in bilateral uh, complete uh, injury for uh, uh, to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, um, there is a high risk of uh, aspiration. So <clears throat> either they can go in for a gastrostomy or, uh, or uh, a silicone injection in place or um, or, uh, or tracheostomy because he, they, these patients tend to uh, aspirate on their own secretions. So these are uh, the images for uh, various uh, nerve palsies. So prevention is better than managing cause of recurrent laryngeal nerve. So many of the centers are practicing uh, uh, neuronal uh, neural uh, integrity monitoring uh, uh, endotracheal tubes and uh, needle electrodes placed directly into the substance of the thyroid cartilage. And here you have another probe uh, uh, directly sitting on the, uh, on the vagus to monitor uh, nerve integrity. Moving over to hematoma. So again, uh, uh, British Association for uh, Endocrine and Thyroid uh, Surgeons, along with DAS, has come up with this uh, guideline to manage uh, post-operative hematoma in uh, uh, thyroidectomy cases. So what they start off is we need to evaluate these patients at a regular interval, look for, assess uh, DSATs, look for any difficulty in breathing, is there any swelling, is the patient anxious, is the patient decubinate, or how is the saturation? Then in case it is getting compromised, you need to call for help and then start the scoop protocol. Wherein uh, in, in, uh, in the hospitals which come under this scoop protocol, a scoop box is actually placed at the bedside of uh, every uh, thyroidectomy patient. So there is no time which is wasted. So SCOOP stands for skin exposure, C, cut sutures, open skin, open muscle, pack the wound. So after having evacuated the hematoma, after following the SCOOP protocol, we reassess the patient. If there is uh, improvement, we, uh, we uh, observe the patient. In case there is no improvement and is deteriorating, we go in to intubate the patient. All right. If we are successful in intubating, again, we oxygenate and we, we monitor the patient. In case we fail to intubate, we directly go in for front of neck surgical axis. So moving on to hypocalcemia, again, uh, the big brother, British Endocrine, British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid uh, Surgeons have come up with their own guidelines, which says that every thyroidectomy case should be started off with three grams of elemental calcium, along with a thousand international units of uh, vitamin D3 to be given to all cases as soon as they're orally allowed. And they ask for measurement of serum calcium and intact uh, parathyroid hormone which has to be done within four hours post-operatively. And they ask us to evaluate the serum albumin level if it is not done pre-operatively because we need uh, serum albumin to, to measure the corrected calcium. So uh, <clears throat> if it is uh, low, we check every 12 hourly until it, uh, 48 hours post-operatively. If two consecutive values are in the rise, are stable or in the rising stand, we stop, uh, uh, um, we stop checking and then uh, we start to taper off uh, calcium. The management of uh, severe hypocalcemia will be dealt later <clears throat> in uh, parathyroid uh, malignancy, which is in the later part of this uh, webinar. Moving on to uh, specific consideration, we start off with uh, tracheal dissection. This is uh, <clears throat> uh, case number four, case scenario, which was uh, seen in our institute. This is a 74-year-old male. He came in with a one-year history of uh, uh, 
a small, not a large, a small uh, thyroid swelling. And then uh, he did present with uh, Strider. Uh, IDL uh, showed that uh, the patient had right vocal cord uh, palsy. The lab values, lab reports, again, were uh, unremarkable. Then uh, if you look at uh, this x-ray, you can see the tracheal, uh, tracheal deviation. And this uh, lateral view, <clears throat> lateral uh, soft tissue x-ray shows that there is tracheal compression one by the thyroid swelling. And then you can see there is the uh, um, intratracheal luminal growth luminal growth which is caused from the posterior aspect of the the trachea <clears throat> sorry about that here in the ct scan you can see that there is a breach in the uh, posterior aspect of the trachea and the narrowest dimension of the trachea was 8 mm in this patient so we went ahead, we pre oxygenated the patient, we uh, induced the patient with uh, 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 propofol, then we were able to successfully mask, ventilate, we went in, went ahead and paralyzed the patient. We chose a 7 size, 7 mm uh, endotracheal tube to intubate. So uh, it went in with a snug fit and with quite a bit of a gritty feel. And you can see that uh, it took away a part of the uh, thyroid uh, swelling with it, uh, considering there was a breach in the tracheal wall. So, and then uh, we uh, uh, we were uh, uh, lucky to retrieve it uh, on endotracheal suctioning, suctioning at the beginning of uh, uh, the surgery. So, <clears throat> this is an intraoperative pick where you can see that uh, there is quite a bit of a breach from the posterior lateral aspect of the, the trachea by the thyroid uh, tumor. So, uh, the uh, decision was made to do a tracheal resection. So, a total of... Uh, uh, three uh, tracheal rings were uh, planned for uh, excision. So, uh, if you see the setup for a tracheal resection after the the uh, the desire or the intended uh, number of rings have been chosen, it is cut. So, uh, the endotracheal tube with which we intubated the patient uh, becomes this, which is there in the proximal part of the trachea. And the distal part of the cut trachea is again intubated with a flexometallic or a, a, a reinforced tube. Um, <clears throat> and the surgeon has complete access or control over the airway in, in that, that he is using an umbilical tape to secure the, the endotracheal tube in the proximal airway uh, by taking an umbilical stitch in the Murphy's eye. So he'll be able to at any time uh, pull it down after he is uh, done with the uh, procedure. So here you can see that uh, this is the uh, this uh, after the trick the trachea is being uh, cut. A uh, total of three rings are being uh, uh, removed. So the uh, the distal segment is being intubated by a, a wire reinforced endotracheal tube, and uh, you can see a, a, a suture. Uh, uh, going through the uh, Murphy's eye in the endotracheal tube, which is placed in the proximal uh, cut end of the trachea. So once the once the surgeon addresses uh, the suturing or the anastomosis in the posterior uh, tracheal wall, what the the distal endotracheal tube, the flexometallic tube, is taken out, and the the surgeon just tucks on that umbilical tape or the suture which is holding on to the endotracheal tube in the proximal end and brings it down, and then sutures around the endotracheal tube here what we have to ensure it that uh, ensure is that the uh, the cuff should not be lying exactly over the suture line or there will be a higher chance of dehiscence so you have to ensure that the cuff is beyond the the suture line so this is an intraoperative pick of the uh, tumor so you can see that the uh, the tracheal wall is being uh, by uh, being breached by this uh, uh, thyroid malignancy. So um, this patient was uh, uh, was kept in the ICU for a total of 48 hours where we did not, uh, we did not extubate this patient. This is to ensure that uh, that there is no breach when the patient extends the neck. So this uh, chin stitch stays in place for total of seven days. So at the end of uh, 48 hours, we take this patient back to the OT and uh, we have the uh, surgical team scrubbed and ready for a tracheostomy if there is a need. And then we place an airway exchange catheter through the endotracheal tube and then we extubate and we watch for any 
signs of respiratory distress. If at all there is distress, we can do one, we can reintubate over the airway exchange catheter, or at least we would be able to ventilate through the airway exchange catheter through a ventilating bougie or uh, airway exchange catheter. And if both of these fail, the surgeon just has to open up the skin and then the trachea is right there and then he can go ahead with the tracheostomy. So uh, moving on to large uh, large retrosternal thyroids, they uh, essentially function like an anterior mediastinal mass with it comes with a uh, host of uh, airway compressive symptoms, circulatory collapse symptoms. This is, uh, I will not delve too much into it because it's been discussed at length uh, uh, in a previous webinar on anti and uh, anesthetic management of anterior mediastinal masses. So uh, moving on to uh, anesthetic concern in robotic uh, uh, thyroid surgeries. So in robotic thyroid surgeries, uh, um, um, we use uh, oral flexometallic tubes for uh, transaxillary and retroauricular approach. And we use, uh, in case it is an anterior chest wall approach, we use either a nasal or a north pole uh, uh, tube for uh, transoral uh, robotic thyroid surgeries. Here, um, um, irrespective of the approach, laryngeal nerve injury is always something which has to be concerned. Then, absolute immobility in these patients once the patient is stopped is of prime importance. We can't have the patient move even the slightest bit after the uh, robo is stopped. And considering uh, Considering the uh, large physical distance between the patient and us, we have to have long IV, uh, IV lines and long breathing circuits. And there is always a, a probability of quite a bit of uh, character body stimulation. So we need to monitor that and be ready for quite a bit of uh, hemodynamic per uh, perturbation in case it is, it is in that area. And then uh, these are the uh, port placements for uh, uh, trans-oral uh, robo uh, assisted the thyroidectomy so you can see all of them uh, being placed here so this is the anterior uh, chest wall approach for uh, robotic uh, thyroid surgeries so the concerns remain pretty much the same in uh, uh, endoscopic thyroid surgeries mm -hmm. so uh, these are the various approaches or the various port placement this is your uh, uh, intraluminal approach, your axillary approach, your uh, anterior chest wall approach. So, and this is a uh, port placement in uh, uh, axillary approach. So, uh, at the end of the day, they uh, the surgeons try to create uh, a plane, a working field by uh, by insufflating uh, uh, CO2. Either it will be in a subcutaneous plane or a subpectoral facial plane. So, postoperatively, you can expect quite a bit of uh, uh, surgical emphysema in these patients. So, in case it is uh, extending uh, onto the uh, onto the neck, uh, uh, it, it it no way in no way will threaten the airway. So, we can go ahead with the uh, extubation in case surgical emphysema is also involving the neck, because it will not be causing any compression to the uh, structures underneath. But uh, but the care has to be taken during extubation with respect to. Uh, again, your recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, your laryngeal edema, and uh, your hypocalcemia, and all of that, which is usually associated with any normal thyroid uh, surgery. So, uh, moving on to uh, anesthetic concerns in uh, parathyroid malignancies, we will go with preoperative, intraoperative, and uh, postoperative concerns. So, the commonest indication for uh, surgery is uh, primary hyperparathyroidism uh, from a parathyroid adenoma. Um, uh, parathyroid, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is usually caused by a single parathyroid adenoma in 90% of the cases, by multiple adenomas or hyperplasia in 10%, and by carcinoma in 1 to 2% of the cases. So, this disease is classically known as a disease of uh, stones, bones, abdominal groans, and psychic moans. So there is a high risk of uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, related deaths in these patients owing to uh, hypercalcemia. And uh, uh, because of the demineralization of bones, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, increased risk of uh, fracture in these patients. Preoperative optimization mainly involves in uh, parathyroid, uh, parathyroid malignancies involves around stabilization of the uh, calcium levels. 
hyper uh, severe hyper uh, calcemia is a medical emergency and uh, treatment should be prompt and we should not wait uh, for the final diagnosis to be complete and um, so mm -hmm. moving on to the management of hypercalcemia the first thing is we, we put in a, a white bar uh, iv cannula and we perfuse these patients with normal saline it, uh, run it at around 150 to 200 ml per hour, maintain a urinal growth at least 100 ml uh, per hour, but care should be seen and uh, uh, caution should be exercised in patients who cannot tolerate uh, overload. And then uh, this effect will last, uh, this effect of lowering uh, calcium levels will last as long as um, rehydration is taking place. This is followed by uh, administration of uh, calcitonin. So calcitonin takes around four to six hours to act and the effect of uh, lowering calcium uh, lasts for around two to three days. So calcium can be given uh, IV uh, followed by subcutaneous. And, uh, but again, this effect is uh, transient. It lasts for a maximum of two to three days. Uh, the drug of choice in hypercalcemia is uh, bisphosphonates, be it zoledronic acid or uh, uh, pamidronate. So uh, it takes in the effect of uh, bisphosphonates lasts a good uh, four to six uh, weeks, but it takes uh, around two to four days for it to, for the action to kick in. So once we have uh, uh, hydrated, rehydrated this patient adequately, we go in for uh, forced, di uh, forced diuresis using furosemide. And then um, uh, these patients can receive a, a, a shot of uh, hydrocortisone. And then patients who are having coexisting renal disease who cannot tolerate uh, reperfusion or dehydration, uh, sorry, uh, rehydration with uh, normal saline, we go in for uh, uh, dialysis. So uh, preoperative calcium levels anywhere uh, below uh, 12 milligram per uh, deciliter is absolutely acceptable. In levels more than 12 grams per deciliter with ECG abnormalities is a reason to defer surgery. And uh, these need to be optimized before taking up the patient for uh, um, parathyroid surgeries. So uh, anesthetic technique, um, if the patient is coming in for a localized adenoma, it can be done under local, either under sedation, uh, local with sedation or uh, cervical plexus block. In case he has uh, to undergo bilateral neck explanation as well, GA with either endotracheal tube or uh, LMA uh, is the technique of choice. So uh, as I previously said, because of hypercalcemia, there's quite a bit of remineralization of the bones and the extreme caution has to be excised while uh, positioning these patients and uh, intubating these patients, considering there could be a, a, a fracture on the slightest of pressure, uh, which is uh, encountered during intubation or positioning of the patient. So um, uh, after, para after uh, parathyroidectomy, magnesium and uh, uh, calcium tends to be uh, redistributed, and uh, they tend to have hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia uh, and the post-operative uh, uh, period. So, uh, co uh, coexisting skeletal muscle weakness uh, suggests the possibility of uh, a reduced requirement for relaxant, uh, but uh, hypercalcemia uh, itself is expected to antagonize the action of uh, uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. In view of this uh, um, unpredictable response, it is uh, advocated to use uh, uh, neuromuscular blocking agents and to titrate uh, the dose of neuromuscular uh, um, uh, blockers and uh, uh, it has to be used while uh, reversing the patient as well. So moving on to uh, post-operative uh, concerns. Again, uh, there is always a concern for uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve trauma, uh, edema of the uh, glottic edema, laryngeal edema, uh, hypo hypocalcemia and uh, hypomagnesemia. So uh, symptoms of hypocalcemia, the patient uh, uh, could start uh, complaining of paresthesia and numbness of the fingertips and the perioral area. So you can illustrate uh, two signs, uh, the chopstick sign where uh, on twitching of the facial nerve, you can see uh, near, near the ear, you can see twitching of, uh, of the eye, uh, eye peri or vital muscles. And then uh, Trouge sign, uh, which is carpopedal spasm induced by inflation of the blood pressure or uh, the cuff. 
So uh, uh, true shows, uh, sign is more uh, sensitive and uh, specific uh, for uh, uh, hypocalcemia. Um, Tetany is seen in uh, uh, very severe hypocalcemia. Uh, you can also see that there is QT prolongation along with ST segment prolongation in these cases. They may have T wave uh, inversion and in severe cases, AV block or uh, uh, ventricular fibrillation. So the critical value for calcium before which we start uh, IV uh, calcium uh, would be uh, six milligram, but uh, uh, a, uh, anything below 8.5 is also good to be started. So, and then uh, we also have to uh, 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 measure the impact uh, PTH level. So, there is again a protocol uh, in place uh, by the British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgeons in place to address hypocalcemia in uh, any post surgical patient. Uh, post-surgical uh, hypothyroidism, they ask us to uh, uh, measure the uh, serum calcium, the albumin and the intact parathyroid hormone level. So if it is well within normal uh, level, uh, if patient is uh, good to be discharged, if the parathyroid hormone is well within normal and uh, calcium is in the lower normal, we can start off with oral supplements as I had previously said. We start off with, uh, with uh, three grams of elemental iron as soon as the patient is orally allowed. And uh, now we're going into this area where the calcium level comes below 7.5 milligram per deciliter and the parathyroid hormone is less than uh, five picogram per ml. So here we start off with uh, uh, IV calcium carbonate and then uh, we reassess the calcium levels in and around uh, four to six hours. And then in case it is persistently low, we tend to measure uh, uh, magnesium as well. And in case hypomagnesiemia is also uh, uh, occurring, so we correct both these uh, 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 together. So uh, IV calcium should always be uh, done in a line which has been placed by you and ensure it is running because extravasation of calcium can uh, cause quite a bit of uh, uh, necrosis. And it always has to be um, uh, administered along with continuous ECG monitoring. And uh, it is advised to measure uh, calcium at an interval of six hours after the initial uh, uh, IV dosing and repeat again at uh, 24 hours post operatively. So, as I said, ensure that the IV is functioning before you start off with the IV calcium and then uh, um, use with caution in patients with the uh, renal disorder and closely monitor the calcium levels uh, in these patients. Uh, to conclude, the anesthesiologists play, play an important role in the management of thyroid and parathyroid malignancy. Clear communication between the surgeon and the anesthesiologist is pivotal in managing head and neck cancers. The anesthesiologist needs to be vigilant and employ the airway management technique that they are most skilled at. The airway management plan should be individualized to the needs of the patient, and there is no one plan which fits all. These are my references for your perusal. So this is our uh, team at the uh, Kidwai Memorial Institute of Oncology. Ours is a 750-bedded oncology center. We, uh, we do get quite a bit of thyroid malignancies around 200, give or take 10. So, um, and parathyroid, we handle around uh, 10 to 12 cases per year approximately. Thank you for your time. You can stop sharing, Kavita, your slides. Yes. So I think we have some questions in the chess box. So let's take them one by one. The first one is, is the cuff leak test reliable and how is it uh, performed? Um, um, well, performing cuff leak test for trachea malacia, uh, what we usually do is the patient is still under anesthesia. 
So we uh, uh, note the set uh, tidal volume and then we deflate the cuff. Ideally, there should be a leak of around 100 to 150 ml. If it is not there, we presume that there is a, a vocal cord edema. Uh, um, the sensitivity of this uh, is pretty, it's pretty reliable, but it always has to be confirmed with the uh, uh, a fiber optic bronchoscope. That is the only way of surely uh, confirming whether uh, there is a uh, lotic edema. But uh, do you think is it for tracheomalacia it is of any importance or for the vocal cord edema? Ma'am, this is mostly for vocal cord edema, not for tracheomalacia, ma'am. For tracheomalacia, you have to, uh, you have to, sorry about that. In uh, tracheomalacia, you have to go along with a fiber optic uh, uh, examination after uh, withdrawing the endotracheal tube over the uh, fiber optic and you have to see there is a collapse that to an end expiratory collapse of the posterior tracheal wall when the patient is breathing. So this is the sure shot way of confirming tracheomalacia. Uh, a cuff leak test would not do justice to it. You have to do a fiber optic uh, uh, guided uh, examination of the trachea. So to add to it, Kavita, if uh, like uh, it's a positive leak test, uh, what would you want to do? Do you prefer to do it for a uh, edema? Like if it's a, as you said, it's highly sensitive. So if it's positive, definitely it gives us a clue that we should do some intervention. But mm. if it is negative, doesn't mean that we have to leave it. We still will have to True. look for. True. Yes, ma'am. That is one thing about the leak test. Yes, then he's asking, could you share your experience with NIMS tube? thyroid surgery what is the level of neuromuscular blockade you keep and additional drug infusions like dexmedomidine that you use uh, we can uh, uh, use uh, dexmedomidine uh, in these patients uh, uh, we may ensure that there is good level of neuromuscular blockade especially we uh, we use infusions especially in uh, um, uh, in robotic uh, thyroid surgeries Otherwise, in, uh, in an open thyroid surgery, we don't, we don't usually monitor uh, you know, neuromuscular uh, blockage on a routine basis. Okay. Um, actually, we don't have NIMS tube also, so I would not say that we can tell you about that tube. But uh, another question. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Up. Sorry, I didn't hear the uh, first bit, ma'am. We uh, we do not use uh, names. We do not have. Good. Uh, sorry, 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 I didn't. I sorry, I did not listen to the first bit of the question. We do not use uh, neural integrity monitoring endotracheal tubes. We do not have that facility. Uh, one, number two, in large thyroid uh, swellings which are having tracheal lumen. Uh, luminal narrowing. I, I would not use such a tube because if you examine that tube, the outer diameter is quite a bit. The inner diameter might be seven, but the outer diameter owing to the, the electrodes and the wires, it, it is quite bulky and you will not be able to place it in these cases which are coming with large thyroid swelling with considerable tracheal narrowing. So, that's... Can I just okay. uh, add to that? Yeah, please, Anjali. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, the question is uh, NIMS tube for robotic thyroid surgery. And what is the level of neuromuscular blockade to keep uh, you keep and additional drug infusions like dexmedetomidine? So if you were, as uh, Kalpana, uh, Kavita has rightly pointed out, the tube is quite bulky. So, you know, uh, you have sizes which are slightly in excess of what you would normally place. So she's right that we cannot place them in these cases. But if you were using it, then you would not use any neuromuscular blockade. No, no, no. Yes, ma'am. Because and you need to. Yeah. And you would go in for total TIVA and you would um, use BIS or something like that uh, in addition to that. Yes. So it's a very successful tool for uh, those who can afford it. It's quite an expensive device as well. Yes. And do you use it? Um, no, we haven't used it, but this is what I uh, collect from the people who do use it. So. Yeah, because lots. People are using, I have heard in Delhi, a lot of people are using it. Yeah. So we use it. Somebody has written, I wish they were. Uh, good Aparna, uh, would you like to comment any further on it? Or if you would like to join the panel, we could uh, do that. If we can add it till then, we'll take a question and we can add Aparna and she can give us the experience about the NIMS tube, which they use in their institute. 
um another uh, question kavita any experience in awake video laryngoscopy while maintaining spontaneous respiration in narrow airway uh yes uh, quite a few cases have been done in our institute uh, as uh, uh, part of a, a pilot study program where uh, we are either uh, uh, nebulizing the patient with uh, uh, lignocaine and uh, uh, we use the uh, 10% topical spray on the onto the tongue and then after heavy counseling Uh, but we do not use sedation we do not use any amount of sedation and then we do go in with uh, uh, awake uh, video laryngoscopy and then we do intubate such patients yes uh, so i would add to it that uh, uh, doing awake video laryngoscopy actually if you just prepare the patient as good as you prepare your fiber optic uh, patient only thing is because uh, you put the scope the base of tongue needs to be really nicely anesthetized so if you can spray that area better before so uh, yes it can be done and yes we have done uh, all of you can try it and especially if you do with the cmac video laryngoscope it is much much better than the other ones so other thing what kavita they are asking is how was the child anesthetized for the laryngotracheal incision uh the child was not uh, anesthetized at all it was after counseling the patient was position he was propped up and it was only and only with local infiltration that we were able to do front of neck access and the laryngotracheal fissure was done by the surgeon we did not use any sedation we could not afford to use sedation because it was already a compromised child a child in strider and i would not want to mix uh, sedation in such a scenario where i i am not capable of uh, uh, gaining airway access so it was only under local anesthesia and with counseling so i'll add to it that since this child's every part there was engroing there was he was using all his accessory muscles and this was some uh, one or two years ago which we did it and probably if i do this case again now maybe uh, i may do it little differently but yes we didn't have a uh, in a striderous child and an uncooperative child uh, chances to do pediatric fiber optic would have been also very difficult and since we didn't want to lose the airway at any moment yes it's brutal to do under local but the child was very cooperative and a good infiltration we were able to do this case and uh, he he came back for follow up with the tracheostomy also so i mean it felt really good doing that case which was you know which is really difficult another question kavita what is the role of uh, leothyronine for emergency surgery with severe hypothyroidism uh yes it uh, emergency thyroid all right uh, it, it, thyroid surgery or any emergency surgeries okay yes it can be used and it should be used because uh, perioperative uh, morbidity in severely hypothyroid patient is quite a bit the, we can lose a patient on table because of uh, congestive heart failure so it's definitely have a it plays a pivotal role in managing severe uh, hypothyroidism another very uh, interesting question which is my favorite why not to use fiber optic for any anticipated difficult intubation which is very safe okay uh so one yes definitely i would agree that uh, fiber optic is the the gold standard and most of the literature says and they have tried fiber optic as the first line but i have a few issues with it number one in a patient who's already having a compromised airway he's having quite a bit of tracheal lumen narrowing and then you place a fiber optic into that it causes a cork and bottle phenomenon one in case the patient starts struggling and i will not be able to take the tube out i will not be able to take the scope out in case it is to in case i somehow am able to thread the tube onto the fiber optic scope and it tends to be a little a size too big for the patient i will not be able to change the tube and again thirdly in case i have to the patient can have in a in a patient who's already compromised having strider and i spray as i uh, and i follow the technique of spray as you go and this local anesthetic can trigger uh, quite a bit of a bad laryngospasm or a bronchospasm that is a situation i do not want to be in and in case it starts bleeding i'll only be seeing red and i will not be able to see where i am going so these are few of the reasons uh, i am sure many of you agree why fiber optic bronchoscopy though it is feasible might not be uh, feasible in most of the situations that uh, uh, thyroid malignancies with tracheal 
uh, luminal narrowing presence with? So I will add to it. Uh, actually, when initial years, uh, we used to, if any um, tracheal diameter was less than five millimeter, patient develops frider, and we used to not think of fiber optic. But wherever most of the uh, case reports or like where fiber optic is done, the lumen was little bigger. Their scopes were little smaller. But as Kavita showed so many case reports where they tried fiber optic, they failed. So they took the uh, other way, the conventional way. So the thing is, the biggest point what Kavita said was that in when I'm doing a conventional or radio laryngoscopy, and if my tube, like how that uh, boy, the gritty feeling of bougie, the same time we could decide if I had already railroaded my tube, I wouldn't have been able to push it. I have to get my scope out, right? And I can decide whether I want to use a stillet, I want to use a bougie, I want to use a smaller size tube, I can change the size of the tube, which I may not be able to do in the um, uh, fiber optic. Another thing is like most of these thyroids, uh, the problem is beyond the vocal cords. So putting the tube be till the vocal cord is not an issue most of the times. I, if I can tell you in my 27 years, very few thyroids I've seen which have a difficult intubation other than like they have other uh, airway parameters like they have OBs or there's some other factor to it besides thyroid that they may be difficult. But most of the time we are able to sail through. So I'm not saying that it will always be 100%. You need to take care of, you need to see that particular patient. And as I said that the guidelines always tell us that where to put the tube all the airway guidelines say us put the tube beyond the vocal but none of the guidelines were telling us what to do when the airway difficulty is beyond the vocal cords but i'm very happy that now the latest guidelines which have come in 2022 have are speaking about rigid bronchoscope ecmo and everything which were not spoken earlier so that is why this is all personalized even your thing whether you want to do fiber optic you can go ahead with fiber optic until you're, you have to decide about the diameter of your fiber optic and the diameter. And remember that in an uncooperative patient, stridorous patient may not be very cooperative in allowing you to do a optic. You want to add something else, Anjali or uh, Kavita? I want to say something about this. Um, see, one thing is there that there is the cock in the bottle effect. So you've got a very narrow lumen through which this patient is breathing and now you're occluding that as well. So that's going to be uh, quite difficult for the patient to tolerate. The other thing, um, that point was brought in by uh, Kavita very well, that there are different ways of doing the same thing. And what is right in my hands may not be right in your hands. Absolutely. So, you know, and uh, what we saw from the case reports that she showed us was that people took one approach and they wisely moved on to the other one, which proved to be successful. So there is this, you know, this plan continuation error that nearly everybody talks about today. So they avoided that. So that is a learning lesson from this, that this is what we need to understand and need, we need to follow. The other thing I feel um, felt was that there is another thing that, you know, the segment of narrowing in most of these cases is going to be very small. So we have to understand, are we going to be able to cross that segment or not? Plus, it is not necessarily a fixed obstruction. In some cases, it may be rock hard. It may be difficult, but in most cases, you will be able to pass through that lumen because this patient has been alive all this time. So it's not a fixed obstruction which is causing, uh, you know, which will be immovable. So when you pass your tube. So these are the things that we need to understand. Of course, I'm not saying, I feel that, you know, I really want to congratulate Dr. Namrata, Dr. Kavita and their team in Kidwai because of the type of patients that they showed the collage of at the beginning. It would be something that would cause all of us to get a little bit of palpitation. So I think it is a high volume center which can truly address this issue. So it is also a question of, you know, should you do it at your own place or should you hand it over to someone else? Um, since I've got uh, a chance to speak, I'm also going to thank all the members of the audience who are not actually members of SOPSI for joining us today. And I would encourage them to join in if they find the discussion useful. The other thing um, that I wanted to uh, say, which perhaps is not really relevant to this point itself, is uh, Dr. Shah has put in another comment about the NIMS tube. Yeah, I'll re uh, we can read it out. Uh, go ahead, Anjali. So um, he's used a size 7 NIMS tube today. 
and it doesn't get he says that it doesn't get all that bulky atracurium or a short acting uh, muscle relaxant can be used for intubation i agree completely because it is during the dissection that you actually need to uh, use the stimulation the effect wears off by the time the tunneling uh, is done for reaching the thyroid uh, yeah that's right and it is very useful although costly to you position of the four electrode strips on the cuff need to be in contact with the larynx for proper effect perfect uh, Mona Lisa, can I ask you to ask Dr. Uh, Aparna to join because she would like to comment on this. So Anjali, till Aparna joins, I wanted to tell yes. you what uh, point you brought out. See, even if the narrowing is 5 size, 5 millimeter, 4 millimeter, these thyroids are 90% compressible. So you're able to put a 6.5, 7 size tube also. So that yes. also you should uh, keep it. Another thing I want to tell you is like you have done a conventional thing. You put your endotracheal tube after you have paralyzed, you put the fiber optic through the endotracheal tube. Then you can still, what the advantage you were getting for fiber optic, you can still get it. You can still push your tube beyond the compression under fiber optic vision. That one thing you can do. If you don't have fiber optic that time, you push your endotracheal tube on the right side. Fully right, right side. Yeah. Keep pulling it till you feel it is bilateral equal. Yeah. So this is what like in most of our tracheal resections, what we did, we used to do conventional so that we don't touch the tumor. Once the tube is inside, put the fiber optic through the tube and slowly push the tube under vision. So that is one thing which you can, uh, you know, do later after doing a video laryngoscopic intubation or conventional intubation. You can do that. And actually, we have so much of imaging now that the 90 degree scopy gives us a supraglottic area. We know that a thyroid will not be. So then you have your CT scan. You can have a virtual endoscopy, which can tell you the, you know, even the flow beyond the. So all right now we have enough things to, you know, make life for us. Uh, so would you agree on uh, one? I mean, what would, what would your opinion be? So suppose uh, you, instead of going for a fiber optic, so I think the idea of having a fiber optic is being safe. That is what the question says, that it's safe in all options. So um, rather than that, um, and I understand that you said that it's not the upper airway, but it's the lower airway that is difficult. But here the idea seems to be we preserve spontaneous ventilation. Okay, so that is the idea uh, behind the question. So in that case, uh, would you say that anesthetizing and using a video laryngoscope, uh, answering the airway, upper airway and using a video laryngoscope would be a good idea. So uh, when most of the times we try that way, mm. if the patient, otherwise the best thing what we do is we give propofol with the patient breathing, we do a check scopy. Okay. Okay. And then, and if our mask ventilation was good and we were having difficulty in intubation, like if the bougie is not going, we paralyze. Otherwise we do it in a way only. We just put railroad the tube. Patient may move a little, patient may move a little, but it is better than losing the airway. So you do paralyze if your bougie does not pass, then you do paralyze. No, that happened only in some cases where the bougie is, where it was like, it was last few cases were like three millimeter, two millimeter. And the one she showed actually CT scan said that there is no opening in the trachea, which uh, Kavita, Kavita, what was that? Uh, uh, Karthik's uh, diameter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it was 1.2 uh, mm by 2.2, uh, 22.2 uh, mm, ma'am. Uh, transverse by uh, AP dimension. Report so 1.2, 1 1.2 mm. This is the report. 1.2. In uh, virtual endoscopy, uh, it showed no opening at all. Wouldn't it be safer to have a CP bypass ready than in such a bad airway? What is uh, your. Uh, comment on having a cardiopulmonary bypass ready to use if it's that bad an airway i mean then so you would, would have to uh, kavita would you like yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, ideally yes uh, we should have a cardiopulmonary bypass uh, primed and ready for uh, managing such a case but unfortunately we do not have one so uh, uh, I, I would say we were quite, uh, quite brave and we did take a chance. And then uh, at the same time, we had a rigid bronchoscope standby and we know that all tracheal tumors are not very hard and they can be lifted. And number two, we had surgeon standby to do a, a laryngotracheal fissure at a moment's notice. So these were the reasons why we went ahead with this surgery. And uh, with uh, managing this case without having a, a backup of uh, CPB. Um, may I just chip in? Hi, 
good evening hi viba here hi no i think the only place where you need to be extremely cautious while doing this is when it is an anaplastic carcinoma because an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma can be very hard firm it actually erodes the trachea inside and anything pushing blind can actually take a piece of the tumor and dislodge it distally um so other than that i completely agree uh, with what you said but uh, that is just one word of caution yes yeah, so uh, what's your experience i would like to say one up? thing uh, yeah. sorry about, i'm so sorry to no, it, please go ahead and about go ahead. the cp bypass question okay CP bypass is not something to keep ready. It is something to be instituted. So in, only in those patients where under local anesthesia, you can institute femur or femoral bypass. That is the only place where ECMO or CP bypass is of use to us because you cannot institute CP bypass so that you can salvage both the brain and the heart of a patient where the airway has failed. So if we intend to use CP bypass, if we have the means to use CP bypass, we in, we should have the team there and should institute the femoral femoral bypass so that we are assured of oxygenation yes and then think about the airway yes so if it's really that bad you need to refer to a higher uh, institute where there is a cpb but most of the time when we think of cpb is mostly if it's a retrosternal goiter which is a big one so here it was actually above that so the chances what was problem is whether you can bypass the narrowing so that is why our plan a b c was rigid bronchoscope and as kavita said the laryngotracheal because we had some experience with having laryngotracheal fissures and it's the same surgeon who was doing all the time so you that is what we do not know anything about laryngotracheal fissures so do tell us so it's actually 1959 it was done 90 it's it's very old thing which used to be done so that that we can you know i uh, think it it has to be done by a surgeon none of us will be right so i think we can probably in icc we'll be talking on that so we can take from there so another question kavita but, uh, any... i'm sorry i interrupted your question about the the anaplastic carcinomas you were going to ask vibha very vibha because i have i remember doing um, say about 3 4 anaplast i just wanted to know what is vibha's experience in anaplastic uh, thyroids um so yeah i mean uh, normally as you said uh even if it is the trachea is narrow you can oversize the tube but you have to be extremely careful when it comes to anaplastic even doing an emergency front of neck access is also very difficult for the surgeon because all the uh, tissue there are fused so if anaplastic carcinoma actually comes with a very significant narrowing i think we should give the patient benefit uh, of cardiopulmonary bypass it also is not there in my institute so you might have to refer to an appropriate place So do you have you done any cases with anaplastic yeah yeah many of them many of them but as i said that you have whatever the narrowing is uh, probably just a slightly bigger tube that's about it but by and large you need to stick to the dimensions that are given on ct scan and size your tube accordingly uh, yeah So, and be careful that if there is any intratracheal extension then uh, that tumor doesn't fracture while you are pushing in the tube were you there for kavita's full uh, presentation yeah yeah of course do, do you see do you remember that she shown one syringe with a small uh, fraction shape yeah yeah shape? yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh so how was it retrieved then totally uh, subclavian either way whatever way you would have used you would have hit it whether whichever mm. mechanism whichever way you would have planned to secure the airway you would have hit it so we knew we are going to hit it so <laughs> Anyway, the next it question. It was the suction catheter to the rescue. So on suctioning, we were able to retrieve it, ma'am. Oh, okay. I remember myself and Kavita were there for that case. So, <laughs> okay. Next question, Kavi. Uh, Kavita, they are say any experience with cervical plexus block? Um, I have uh, personally not uh, uh, used uh, superficial or deep cervical plexus block, but uh, it is an excellent tool. But in uh, excellent tool to to provide uh, postoperative anesthesia, especially uh, analgesia, especially the superficial uh, cervical plexus block. But I uh, I have not tried it. Uh, if any of you, Anjali or Vibha, if you have any uh, you know uh, experience on cervical plexus block, and I- tried a couple but surgeon uh, was upset with the fluid and the difficulty with cautery and it never really picked off from there 
Okay, I actually know of a team, um, a husband and wife in Nagpur who does this very frequently, especially in the rural areas in Melghat, where you do not have um, access to anesthesia per se. And they have a lot of incidents of goiter over there. So this is what they do. So basically, it's the coordination between the surgeon and the anesthetist which makes this technique successful. Um, that needs to be kept in mind. So it is, uh, you know, it, it goes to the surgeon needs to be able to do things quickly and know what he's putting his hand into. So uh, that's important. Uh, also, uh, Aparna has actually joined the panel. Because yeah, that's good. I wanted to say Aparna. Huh? Hi. No, basically, there was a question about the NIM tubes, uh, the neuromonitoring tubes for thyroid. So we, I just wanted to share the experience. We have used it quite frequently. And I don't think in a really big goiter where we are worried about the airway, that would be the case where they would go for uh, nerve monitoring. It would be the moderate size uh, goiters where they are worried about the nerve injury. Those would be the uh, cases where they use the NIM tubes. And usually we haven't had airway issues when we are using the neuromonitoring. It is not terribly bulky. It is just some small strips at the side which align with the vocal cords. So it's not terribly bulky. It's quite easy to put. It's just like a reinforced tube. So it's quite use, uh, easy to put two electrodes coming out of it. The way we do it is for induction, we use atracurium to paralyze and intubate. And by the time they are ready to um, dissect the nerve, the atracurium has worn off. So after that, we don't use any muscle relaxant. We use dexmedetomidine and propofol infusions. And it's not necessary to be totally TIVA. We can use sevoflurane or inhalation agents. So we use inhalation agent, propofol, dexmedetomidine combination, fentanyl boluses, maybe with remifentanyl coming around people might use remifentanyl infusions and once the dissection is done towards the closure if we want to paralyze the patient they will let us know that they are done with the monitoring and we can again institute a neuromuscular block or just continue the way we are so it's not um, too awkward or too bulky to use the NIM tubes and Aparna what's the price of that tube I think it's somewhere around 8 to 10,000 but I'll have to check it I've, um, I will check it but it's, and it's it, on the expensive it's... side but uh, we have used it yeah and they are not reusable, right? No, not reusable Even because the electrodes and all are there. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Your yes. Thank you. Nice have come down. When we had inquired about it, uh, we had been told 25,000. So I'm glad the price has come down. Maybe we'll start oh, I may be wrong. I'll have to check, but I don't think it's 25,000. I'll check it again. It's yes, hmm. around 8,500. Oh, excellent. 8,500. Okay. So I think, uh, Anjali, the last comment we can take, if anything else, anybody has. Yeah, Dr. Padmaja D has commented about uh, doing a case on femoral femoral bypass. So, yes, it is being done. Um, and I'll just uh, like to add a comment. I think it's very important that you all emphasize that fiber optic intubation is not the gold standard for huge thyroids. I mean, we've had all, all of us, I think, have gone through a problem where there's a huge thyroid and putting in a fiber optic scope really gets them into a strider and laryngospasm kind of a situation. So I think conventional laryngoscopy is a lot better for large thyroids. Um, for airway management. And the third point about tracheomalacia. So I don't think cuff test, cuff leak test is for tracheomalacia. It, usually the surgeon can feel the consistency and we have a fair bit of suspicion before we are ready to extubate that this might be a tracheomalacia case. And as you said, examine in fiber op our fiber optic bronchoscope, that would be the sure shot method. So I have a question to all of you, Anjali, Aparna, Vibha, that uh, how many tracheomalacias you Seen where you have done tracheostomy? Is it very frequent or very rare? Usually, the places where I have worked, most of the time, if they suspect tracheomalacia, we would leave the endotracheal tube for a day or two, maybe re examine them in the ICU or get them back to the OT, re examine, and uh, then decide about whether to go for tracheostomy. But first choice would be to keep the endotracheal tube in for a couple of days and then take a call. But I think, Kaparna, if uh, that would be for edema, like if in two days it subsides, I think it would be more of edema rather than, uh, anyway, I mean, I just, yeah, just... yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes we've been able to get No, no, actually, a uh, couple of hours is definitely better because I feel <clears throat> sometimes even minute amount of muscle relaxant uh, action, if it is there, then it might get exaggerated. So, uh, I mean... I think it's okay to keep the tube for a couple of hours, maybe even till next day morning, if you have suspicion of tracheomalacia. And then, um, yeah, extubate okay. if everything goes fine. Otherwise, reintubate and bring up for tracheostomy. 
Kavita, would you want to add something to it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the incidence of trachea marasia is very, very rare. It is uh, roughly around 0.05%. If it is a true trachea marasia, which means that there is uh, degeneration of the trachea and there is loss of myoelastic support, it will not recover in a day or two with observation. It requires a tracheostomy. And when you look at the management of uh, tracheomalacia, so after your uh, tracheostomy, initial tracheostomy, they have to have a re-evaluation at four weeks, a re-evaluation using the FOB, and only then they go in for a uh, decannulation. So if it is a true tracheomalacia, it is not something which will recover uh, in a couple of days. It will take a minimum of four weeks for it to be re-evaluated and for it to regain its position. Yeah, I, I actually agree to that. However, uh, in borderline cases, I mean, maybe it was never tracheomalacia because the patient uh, actually did well when we extubated after a couple of hours. But the early, uh, the extubation on the table, the patient did have some kind of, you know, sucking in kind of a phenomena uh, and probably it just improved uh, with time. So maybe it never was true tracheomalacia. I agree. So what we want to say is whenever suspicion, it's always good to keep the airway patent, whether for 24 hours, 72 hours, uh, extubate uh, inside OT or outside with the surgeon around. What you can exchange on an airway exchange catheter, you can do. You need to take, you need to be safe. So uh, whether it's tracheomalacia or was the edema which was subsiding, but it is basically we want the airway to be patent. That is one thing. One, Anjali, one last thing, can I just... No, I just wanted to add uh, the role of uh, ultrasound focus for oh, looking yeah. at vocal cord movements. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, patients are very frail, elderly, borderline. You don't really want to extubate them and give that laryngoscopy lifting pressure. It's always better that under deep anesthesia, you reverse, check the vocal cord movements. And once the surgeon and you are happy and then go ahead to get the patient light and then extubate so I have another question for you, Viba. You said for extubation, but will it help pre-op also? Can you identify the trachea if you are not able to? Like in case for an uh, emergency plan of tracheostomy, can you help the surgeon any which way? Oh, yes, of course. Of course. We've so done it a couple of times. Yeah, huge, huge mass and trachea, if it is significantly deviated, uh, then we can actually mark the trachea from outside for them. So that's what I wanted people to get that. This is really important if we can help the surgeon too. Anjali, do we have time or uh, you want us to conclude? I wanted to make just one comment about this. Like, uh, I'm so sorry. Um, the issue of tracheomalacia, as rightly pointed out, is very, very rare. Okay. What really is worrisome in these cases, if you have a pre-existing nerve palsy and you get a second injury, those are the patients who are actually going to cause problems. We've had two cases like that uh, who needed intubation. And there is some data to suggest that most of the reintubations occur within six hours. So the advice is to place an airway exchange catheter and keep the patient in recovery for six hours before you discharge them. So the best thing would be to leave the tube in situ. But if you have decided to extubate and you have a suspicion that things may go wrong, then keep the patient longer in the recovery. Leave the airway exchange catheter inside. If you, like Vibha said, keep the tube in, that would be the safest option. But if you haven't kept the tube in, if you have chosen to extubate, or even if you choose to extubate in the uh, ICU afterwards, extubate over an airway exchange catheter and leave the airway exchange catheter in situ for six hours. So, but, uh, but you don't discharge thyroid cases at all, right? Yeah, they have to be there or do they still, in private, do they discharge the cases? No, not at all. I'm saying that you do not, Send them to the ward. Yeah. If you're worried, don't send them to the ward. Keep them in recovery. Observe them. So in our hospital, all thyroids stay inside OT. We have two ICUs. So they stay there. And then next day only. Same day, they don't go to the ward. So awesome. <laughs> that is why we keep them. But none of them. The small ones, yeah, hemithyroidic means and all do get uh, shifted to step one. But still, they don't go to the ward. So there should be an accessibility of an anesthesiologist all the time. So this is what is followed in our institute. Ma'am, I would so, like to add a point here, ma'am. Uh, ours is a teaching institute. So uh, 
though the vocal cords might be uh, mobile on initial examination uh, with dissection there might be a neuropraxia which occurs at a later time because of the ongoing edema and inflammation so it uh, there is always a chance of it progressing in the immediate post operative care and we would want someone monitoring these patients in the icu rather than them being in the ward without any one monitoring these patients so i guess that is one other reason why we uh, tend to keep them in close observation uh, in the icu Anything else? No, I think uh, we have answered many of the questions in the chat box. I'm not sure. Sure. I think so. We need. Uh, I think I would just conclude by saying that don't take any thyroid easily because. If I say with my experience, our experience of Kidway, we've done about 35 cases of thyroid infiltrating trachea. And out of them, I will say hardly four or five were visibly huge that you can think of, you know. So infiltrating the trachea has nothing to do with the size of the thyroid. So they can be invasive anytime. So please, please rely on your clinical history and imaging and the other modalities which are now available to us. And always plan, 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 and team communication with the surgeon, not only for the intubation, extubation, and yes, who's going to take care, follow-up care of the patient. I hope if you, everybody has seen the latest guidelines of difficult of airway, it has a follow-up care too. So I think with this, we can end. Kavita, it was a wonderful presentation. And thank you, Anjali, Vibha, Aparna for chipping in. Thank you thank so you much. much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Excellent thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. I wanted to say one thing. Yes, that I wanted to thank Kavita for this lovely, uh, you know, it uh, reminded me of that video that uh, became viral of uh, the nanny running or the mother running behind the two kids. I'm sorry. I'm sorry <laughs> we, that you had to witness all of that. Not uh, at all. That was lovely. Thank you so much. And it was very detailed presentation. Thank, thank you, you to all the audience for staying with us for so long. And we asked Vibhavari uh, Naik and Dr. Aparna Date to join in at short notice. So thank you so much for joining us. Good night. And I hope uh, that you enjoyed the presentation. I'll hand over uh, to Mona Lisa. Good night. With that, yes, with that, we come to the conclusion, everyone. We truly appreciate the chance to facilitate the session today, and we hope that it went really smooth and hassle free to all of you. So, I hereby close the session and looking forward to hosting all again. Thank you so much, and bye to all of you. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. Bye-bye. Good night.